Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode four of the Book Talk Today podcast. And we're joined by uh, adventurer and author of the book, How to Be Comfortable with Being Uncomfortable, 43 Weird and Wonderful Ways to Build a Strong and Resilient Mindset by Ben Aldridge. And we're joined by the author, Ben. Ben, it's great to have you on. Uh, I know we've been uh, chatting a bit behind the scenes on Instagram and, you know, it's a, it's a pleasure to have you on. Hey, Owen. Well, thank, firstly, thank you so much for having me on. It's so brilliant to be able to chat to you about the project and about the book. So, yeah, massive thank you for inviting me to come and chat. You're welcome. You're welcome. One thing I wanted to start with, and I kind of looking at your page and what you were doing through lockdown, I saw that you you scaled the height of Everest on in your on your staircase. Is that correct? I just want to um, I want to kind of show the viewers if they haven't already seen your page because I, I was i was doing some research about you and I, and I saw going through your feed and i saw you in the full kit and you had the little like uh, things on your staircase yeah so that was um that's something that i did in the the like the heart of lockdown when where restrictions were quite tight and we weren't allowed to go out and exercise for more than an hour and i didn't want to limit all of the challenges that i'd been doing and, and mm. i came up with this idea to climb the height of Mount Everest on my stairs. I say fun. It's uh, it's more of a, a kind of, a kind of challenge, really, um, and just that it could be an interesting experiment. And I, I announced that I was going to do it on Instagram, and then I got a lot of feedback, and lots of people were uh, behind the idea. So then it, there was that social accountability, which meant that I, I had to do it. And um, I managed to get some virtual climbing partners, which was quite fun. Okay, that's so good. people were doing it all over and. And I got some, um, I got offered expedition support from a, a proper guiding company, which really made me laugh. They're based in the Himalayas. So it was, that was really nice, that side of it. But it took a long time. It took eight days. Um, I did it over, I just broke it down into like three hour chunks. It took about 21 hours in total to climb. And it was really the monotony of the challenge that was mm. the, the purpose of it. Um, because I do a lot of climbing and mountaineering anyway. So this was... Um, this was a kind of my response to the situation. And actually, I wrote about it for the British Mountaineering Council, which is um, a really nice uh, way of kind of tying that experience into something that uh, people can read. And uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. And yeah, on the final day, I got into full mountaineering kit and put this altitude mask on, which you're supposed to use to train for mountaineering. And it restricts the flow of oxygen to simulate because it's harder to breathe so it just makes it harder um yeah. and that was the purpose for it and it was i just took a load of silly pictures and decorated the stairs so it was a, it was a great experience i just thought it was a really unique challenge i think like you're saying in in this lockdown everyone's kind of finding ways and there are restrictions out there and i thought it was quite a uh, unique way to challenge yourself that monotony must have been quite quite bad sort of midway through you probably think to yourself uh, there's probably ways to work it a bit more interesting perhaps oh yeah absolutely i'd rather be out in the mountains but it was it, the novelty factor wore off very quickly uh, but my girlfriend was working on the you know, the table in the front room and i'm just going up and down the stairs driving her mad so um it was a, an interesting experience that's crazy. Yeah, no, I, I saw that on your feed and I just wanted to ask you sort of what inspired that. I think, I, think, um, I think it was probably, it talked about sort of like the premise of the book. I think the ways in which you can think about being creative, about challenging yourself, regardless of any situation that you're in. So it was nice to see you sort of embody that, embody that principle. Um, in the book, I wanted to ask you, what was the most challenging of your 43 challenges um i think that's always a difficult question because they're in in the the book there's lots of ways that i've been pushing myself and they all test me in different ways um so something like my first ever marathon was really tough because i'd never done anything like that yeah. and that in itself was so physically demanding um it took a lot from me and especially the first one when you've done one you know that you can do it. So you have a different thought process and there's a self-belief that comes off the back of it. But that first one, there's always, there's such a kind of mystery and doubt around whether you can actually do it. So that was 
that was very difficult. I found, um, I walked the Cotswold Way, which was a hundred miles long. And I did that in four days, which was brutally hard. That was probably the most physically demanding challenge. Mm. And uh, that took a lot from me as well. I, I injured myself a little bit off the back of it. Um, and I was just very determined and really pushed, pushed hard to be able to complete that. But probably the hardest out of everything is Hello. So that challenge has been, yeah, that, that, that one is, uh, it's uh, just ongoing as well. There's no end point with it, which is what's, what's so hard. Yeah. It's not like a, a marathon, you complete it. It's an ongoing process of continually um, developing that skill. So that's, that's the ongoing thing. When you go through like a four day challenge like that, I, I always think those ones that are from extended periods of time are always the hardest because with a marathon, you can kind of feel like the end is in sight. I think it's mm. difficult on that first or second day if we're going through that Cotswold walk or something and you're yeah. thinking I've got two days left of this. How do you, how do you, yeah. what do you tell yourself like on that second day, on that second afternoon? Um, I think it, it comes in waves. So it's, it's not as um, textbook as maybe you think you wake up and that's, you know, you're hit with a bit of resistance, but then you get moving and you push through it and then you start to feel good again and then you'll be hit with another wave. And I always think whenever you're hit with a wave, especially if it's a, like an endurance event, the most important thing is to stay positive and just know that it will change because it always does. You feel terrible when you're running a marathon you feel terrible at mile 22 yeah. but then maybe at mile 24 you, you'll start to feel better you get second and third wins mm. and i think it's when you hit with a bit of resistance and negativity it's just staying positive and uh, just waiting for that to that change that will will come yeah i've found that well when i've done like endurance events like i remember when i did my first triathlon i found that i, I mean I, I got out the water and I, it was in a lake and I was wearing a, I was wearing a swimsuit. I was wearing like a, like a, a wetsuit and trying to take the wetsuit off and run out of the water. I got like cramp in my leg. So I'm like hobbling on one leg and I'm trying to take this wetsuit off while I'm going to the station. And I thought to myself, oh my God, I have to now cycle and run on top of this. And I'm getting cramp. And I think you're right. I think you just have to just take it as it comes with these kind of things. Um, and, and I think that's kind of what I got from, from reading the book and the different challenges that you had. The thing that really interests me as well is the, the thing I loved about your book, in fact, was the, the references. Like I love reading books and I get an affiliation when I'm reading a book from an author that has read widely as well, because then there's so many different references from so many different books. In the front part of the book, you talk about stoicism and Buddhism specifically. Did you, did you kind of practice those prior you know earlier on in your life or is it something that came when you started to challenge yourself more so all of this philosophy everything that i got into to help me deal with the challenges and and actually to deal with the anxiety which was the the main cause uh, for writing this book uh, that all came at one point and i just started studying extensively and then all of these ideas um, i would test out with the challenges so there was a higher purpose to doing all of these difficult things. It's not just for the sake of it. All of these challenges are there to test out all of the philosophical and psychological concepts that I've been studying. And it just gives it a real practical application because you can read about all of these things in books, but actually until you put it into practice in a very um, real setting, it doesn't have the same weight or value. And actually when you know something works, then it has, uh, an amount of power to it you know that you can rely on it in the future so that's been this whole this whole thing is all about finding ideas that resonate with me and then getting out and testing them in, in all of these weird and wonderful ways which is extremely varied uh, and can be a lot of fun but we all respond to different information in different ways so some people will latch on to 
maybe they're like me they love stoicism but then there might be something else they they find is particularly helpful maybe there's the a faith in their life that they want to study and use to to deal with challenges or maybe there's something um more scientific or psychological it, it doesn't matter where it comes from but as long as the tool is there and you know that it works then i think that's um that's very valuable for all of us do you feel like there's a flaw in the idea of just the philosophy itself because i think that the application is the most important bit out of any philosophy um there is i can't remember the exact quote but it's saying you know philosophy is action rather than the, the philosophy itself um, I've completely butchered that quote, but I, it's something along it's something along those lines. And I think it's something that's really important, you know. And it's good to read extensively, but if, if the application and the and the practical steps isn't behind it, then you won't actually see the true benefits. When you were reading widely, did you just see? Because I see them saying action, 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 rather than you know embody this principle in in theory only. Yeah, I think. I think it's um, it's so important to do that, to get out there and test it, that action side of it. Um, a lot of philosophy and a lot of ideas, it's, uh, yeah, it, it's great to read about it, but unless you, you work it into your life, then it's just going to be something that you forget because it doesn't have that day-to-day -day application. And I think that's really what's the purpose of studying all of this stuff is to, to be able to live a better life and to be mm. able to be prepared for what happens because we know that the unknown uh, life is is very um it's very uncontrollable and there's lots of things that happen that are out of our control and there is a lot of unknown and all of these things happen and um challenges are inevitable there's no denying that we're all going to face it we all face adversity in different ways so i think it's it's so important to have some kind of system in place to to deal with that whatever that looks like and it's going to be different for every single one of us uh, and that's the beauty of all of this philosophy and these ideas that have uh, lasted for thousands of years is that they can help us mm. if it's even if it's a little bit of help it's better than nothing and not having any system in place so yeah i believe in the application of it and getting out and just really testing it in loads of fun ways and it doesn't have to be um yeah boring you can have you can have fun with it how did you find the people closest to you respond to the challenges that you were taking on because you referenced it a bit in the book but you know in day-to-day -day practice what, what were they saying to you so uh, i think it's it's quite funny because now it's very different now it's just that oh ben's going and ice swimming yeah that's fine ben's <laughs> going and he's climbing everest on his stairs and it just doesn't even really get a uh, much reaction these days because i think it's uh it's something that has happened for quite a long time now where I do all of these different things. Yeah. Um, but at first, I guess it was like, my girlfriend was super supportive when I, but all, cause all of this was really off the back of terrible anxiety mm. and my way of trying to, to learn how to manage it and how to, how to deal with that and understand myself better. So she was really supportive and it always came from a place of support um, and would encourage me to do things and, um, I think that's just, I've always had the support there. So it's never been met with resistance. In fact, loads of people um, join me on challenges and that's been something that's so lovely. Mm. Running marathons with my friends and climbing uh, with friends and going and doing stupid things and yeah, learning about ourselves in the process. That anxiety factor that, that triggered all this um... Did you find that the conventional ways perhaps of dealing with it weren't giving you the results or the, the solutions that you were looking for? Um, to be honest, it was, I think what happened was I was, I went to the doctor, I had all of these things that I didn't know what it was. And, and uh, I went to the doctor who diagnosed it instantly as anxiety. And I didn't think it could be because I didn't think my mind would be so powerful and create all of these physical uh, sensations in my body so I was it was very um it was like a real surprise for me mm. but I've always been someone that when when I want to learn about something I go in hard and I study um to try and understand the situation so all of this came about from extensive reading and I almost didn't get to go down the sort of normal I don't normal the, the yeah. kind of conventional yeah. way of dealing with it so I didn't have therapy I didn't use medication but what I did was read extensively, like obsessively about 
what anxiety was, loads of ways to deal with it and loads of philosophy. And then all of these different ideas started to change the way that I viewed it. Mm. And certain things really resonated with me. And, and actually stoicism was one that really changed my life. And the idea of uh, practicing adversity and this voluntary discomfort thing that the, the Stoics used to do a lot of. I mean, they would hug statues naked in winter so that they could practice being cold and they would roll around in the hot sand and sleep on the floor and do all of these things. So I loved that. And uh, I kind of ran with it. And when I could see that this stepping outside of my comfort zone um, thing actually started to work, I stopped having panic attacks. Um, I knew that there was value in it for me anyway. So I just ran with it and started leaning into it more. And that's where this whole project came from that stepping out of our comfort zones and, and deliberately pushing ourselves. And it's very counterintuitive, but it really does work. And it certainly has done for me. I think that's a really important point that you make that saying that it's counterintuitive, but it works, but it's all, it's, it's almost always the things that seem counterintuitive that work. And, you know, you would have, you wouldn't think, you know, stepping into like an ice bath or having a cold shower would be the thing that really sorts you out. But in fact, it most likely surely is most of the time to really just sort of, I think it's, I think it's getting, I mean, I, I was talking to this with my family the other day, sort of like getting out of your head and into your body is that, is that feeling that when you feel stressed, when you feel overwhelmed, do something that makes the, all the sensations in your body, like alive, that make you feel, you know, exhilarated, whether it's, you know, exposure to heat, exposure to cold, exposure to things that where you're breaking down existing barriers in your mind or whatever it might be. And I think that is the central element of the thing that you're trying to say to people. It's do something that is going to challenge you, whether it's over an extended period of time or whether it's in one, one go to break down those barriers that you have. And I think that's the flaw in the way that anxiety is still kind of taboo is being prescribed. It's you can just take this pill and then you'll be okay or go to this therapist and it'll be okay. And it's, do you think it's a lot more about finding what it means to you and how you define it more than what someone else tells you it is from your own experience? I think with all of this, this is, this is from my own experience because I'm not a doctor and, and I wouldn't be able to sort of say this is definitely going to work for everyone. And it's about finding what works on a personal level. Um, and I think it's always important to consult with a medical professional and get that advice. Um, but what I found that helped me was very much, um, yeah, using these ideas and, and figuring out myself what was, you know, what's going on in my mind and, and learning tools and tricks to, to deal with that in a, in a fun, practical way. That's where I found that I learned more about myself in this short bit like short period of time i've learned so much about who i am and how i deal with um fear and and frustration and all of these different emotions that come up when we face difficulty yeah and that's been something that has has yeah it's really resonated with me but i think it depends on who we are and what we use as a system um but i think the good thing about mental health is that it is getting talked about more and the more we share our experiences with dealing with mental health, the more accessible it is and people become um, able to speak about it more. So I think it's an important subject to talk about, um, but there are many ways to deal with it. And this just happens to be my way and it, it's worked for me. And, and I'm hoping that for people who also experience anxiety, this will be something that they can have a lot of fun with because the fun element is, is hugely important because I think it's very, we can get very serious when we talk about mm. mental health, but actually there's, you know, there's a lot to be said for, you know, just playing around with our, you know, how we respond to things. And uh, also we don't have to be anxious to deal with uh, fear and worry yeah. and stress and frustration. We, you know, everyone has this going on. So I think just stepping out of our comfort zones can do a lot for us in whatever space we are mentally, whether we're very, very anxious or, in a very dark place or whether we're at the top of our game, there's still so much we can learn. So there's a lot, mm. lot to play around with there. I think that's very important as well, because I think to say that someone suffers from anxiety, I think is somewhat, it's a, 
it's it's a thing but i think everyone sort of goes through it in their own way like me personally i never felt like i really suffered from it but i feel like i have bouts of like time periods in which stress kind of overwhelms me and then i've got like this heavy feeling that was like i remember a couple of months ago i was like there was like a new feeling this like heaviness that i felt in my chest and i was like i don't know what this is like i don't know what this is and my mom was like maybe you're feeling like anxious or stressed i'm like maybe like but the only way for me to deal with it was to like go for a run like my prescription was like a run and a cold shower and i was like i was fine so anytime that sort of feeling came across for me i kind of like okay go do something like there's in when you're in that mindset it's very rare can you just kind of sit and work it out you kind of just have to go and do something and you have to go and, and be active when you were constructing the challenges the one that i kind of thought was a really fun one was learning a language because that for me is discipline and do you feel like the discipline is the sort of the, the foundation or the framework to creating a creating a uh, a system in your life to actually do these challenges consistently and see that growth that 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 individual is looking for yeah i think discipline is is essential for everything that we do in our lives and it it's can be it's interesting everyone will have a different relationship with discipline but something epic like learning another language or something that requires a a regular commitment that is discipline and that that does require you to commit to something and that's a test in itself it, regardless of what what it is that you're doing you could replace learning a language with any other skill it's that regularity of it and because you're going to face resistance and you're going to wake up and you're going to be like oh, I, I don't want to do that today or i can't i don't have time and it's learning to manage all of that and learning to that ultimately is what cultivates uh, our discipline mm -hmm. and i think there's a lot of benefit we can have from that regularly committing to something and, and just seeing ourselves progress can be a huge boost. And it's that confidence boost that you get when you push through these barriers. I never thought that I would be able to properly learn a language. And now, I mean, I'm not fluent at all in Japanese, but I can have a conversation, everyday conversation entirely in Japanese, in casual or um, formal Japanese and I can go the last time I was in Japan just um, uh, before Christmas last year in uh, 2019 I didn't use any English the whole time I was there so it was just entirely in Japanese which just changed the experience and it just validated all of those hours that I've been putting into it and it's that reward that was a, a completely different experience and there was more to it than just the Japanese I think it's that committing to a skill and learning a lot of lessons as well. A lot of the philosophical concepts that I talk a lot about could be directly applied to learning a language because it's, uh, it's working with frustration and having an optimistic growth mindset. You're going to be meeting failure on a regular basis. And I think when we fail, it's important to work on our relationship with that. We don't have to give up just because we fail at something or just because we had a bad day. We can use that as a, a kind of a stepping stone and it will help us to progress so i think yeah there's a lot to be said for those commitments. what but the trouble is if you can't commit to too many yeah i think that's the difficulty i think for someone who's hyper ambitious as well or someone that gets the bug it's like i want to do everything now yeah yeah all the time that's it. yeah that's it and that's my uh, probably my problem as well i've got so many things I want to do mm. and it's just choosing which ones stick and which ones I just do for the experience and the learning um, and that's that's it so a lot of the challenges in my book um, have been one of things that I've done and that's that's it whereas other things are more ongoing and I continue to do and I'll always look for different challenges things that I can do as a, a one-off event um, but it, it's important to have a mix of all of that because I think that committing goals where you know, say you wanted to increase your fitness, you wanted to get into running, or if you wanted to do something like that, go to the gym regularly, that's a, an ongoing thing. It's not just like go to the gym once. That's mm. the challenge. It's, you know, that in itself is a committing ongoing thing. And I think it's nice to have those, but also punctuate life with weird one-off bizarre experiences or things that you can just do. And that's it. You've completed it, I guess. Yeah. I think, um, 
I think the thing you, you reference about goals is really important. Do you think I've been asking this quite of a lot of people recently, because I've been thinking quite deeply about it is, do you think trajectory is more important than goals? Um, th- let me explain. So instead of saying like, I need to achieve this specific thing, it's saying this is kind of where I want to be in five to 10 years. And this is sort of the path that I'm ascending to instead of going, oh yeah, I need to do that. And then I need to do that. And I need to do that. It's if you want to be more athletic or you want to become a runner, it's become a runner instead of, you know, doing a marathon or doing whatever it needs to be. Or do you think there needs to be a balance between the both? I think you probably want a balance. I think it is, it's important to focus on process over results for whatever it is, whether it's, uh, especially if you're talking long-term goals, I think with writing, it's a process over the results. Obviously, my desire yeah. was to get my book to be published and out in the world. But when you're back, when you're writing it, when you're in the heart of it, it's just enjoying the process. And each step is going to be very different. And you can set goals and targets, but often life is going to throw curveballs at you and it's not going to be as sort of structured as you might want it to be. So I think it's all about focusing on that process and breaking down. Maybe say you've got a five-year goal breaking it down into smaller steps and working towards each one and then knowing that actually there's going to be disruption. But as long as you focus on that process of keep going and keep doing it and chipping away, um, I think that's hugely important for, for everyone really. It's that chipping away and just mm. trying to get into that mindset of it's uh, it's long game. Yeah. That long game thing is really difficult though for people because yeah. <laughs> the, is, is the impatience is like the reward has to be now. It has to be now. And I think that's where these challenges are really important because it teaches you that, you know, things don't come quickly. And this is where, for instance, I obviously, you know, I love to read. And I think the, the mindset that comes with learning more about how people deal with problems really enlightens you to the fact of really about how things how things come through that chipping away. They never come. And it's, it's almost like you can chip away for, you know, five or six years and not see any fruits of your labor. But then, you know, on that sixth year, as soon as the clock ticks over, everything comes from those previous five years. And I think that's where a structure or philosophy like you talk about is really important because it gives you the knowledge of it's okay to focus just on the process because the results will come in time. And that knowledge is really important for someone who's had such varied experiences and and anyone who has read the book or or will read the book will see your experiences which one do you think provide you with the most learning experience like the one that really said to you okay i am a different person after doing this or it doesn't even have to be in the book like what experience have you had that has really taught you about pushing yourself per, past your limits as as an individual and breaking down barriers i think there's been a lot of lot of that in many different ways and it's, it's probably more of a compound thing actually it's just that you do these little things and every time you break through it's a small win yeah but they all add up and it just it has that boost effect i think if we're talking sort of biggest change probably is um, off the back of climbing and my experiences from learning to climb in different settings so my mountaineering experiences my climbing at the gym and climbing outdoors and bouldering and all of these other kind of adventurous things um, that I've done through climbing because not only is it physical but it's extremely mental as well and there's a there's a huge element of fear that you have to deal with uh, especially in some of the slightly scarier settings I think I've probably been the most scared in my life other than when I was experiencing horrific anxiety and panic attacks that's when that was the most afraid I've ever been Mm. of anything and that's afraid of nothing if that makes sense Uh, but other than that the most fear I've ever felt has been climbing in different settings where the severity of what you're doing is is quite intense and you're just overwhelmed by that and it doesn't have to be particularly technical it's just about maybe you're quite exposed and you're doing something that's difficult for you individually so there's been a few times with that where it's been there's a lot of growth that's happened off the back of that and dealing with a fear of um heights and falling and all of these different things so it's been packed with lessons is that like cliff face like i don't know much about climbing is that is that like 
on like a straight cliff face or is that like i'm assuming with harnesses and stuff you haven't gone like all alex honnold on it and free, <laughs> yeah, no, free climbing definitely not uh, alex honnold style but there's a yeah it's a variety so i'll do mountaineering which is more being up in the high mountains or just up in the mountains in the uk where your um your goal is to summit but you you know there's different routes some might be quite scrambly some might be with uh with gear so you might have rope to protect you uh, and then other times it might be actually uh, climbing on cliffs um and then other times it might be just at the gym uh, which is unfortunate well not unfortunately it's just the reality most of my climbing is gym based mm. um but there's a lot to be learned there as well and just dealing with that um with some of the heights in the gym as well can be quite intimidating especially when you first start so there's a lot of uh, yeah lots of lessons there and and uh, bouldering as well at the gym where you're climbing without a rope but not very high and there's big crash mats so, okay but you're pushing... the one where people kind of do it sideways they like sort of they're like upside down and is it is it all that yeah yeah so the, the bouldering is more about the athletic side of it and just trying the hardest possible routes and just really pushing your body it's very physical mm. whereas maybe when you're doing slightly higher stuff it's more of a head game um i guess that that's the sort of one way of, of describing it. i'm sure climbers will probably have a go at me for that <laughs> nasty description, but um yeah it's mental there's a huge mental side of it um which has been very interesting to explore have you ever tried caving um i've involuntarily like tried uh, i did a route once in the um in the dolomites and it was uh it was a via ferrata, which means there's metal wires and you clip into them as you go around. And this is right up high in the mountains. And this route was kind of like part caving, part mountaineering. So you would be climbing along a ridge and then suddenly you would go into a hole and then you would be in darkness for hundreds of meters. And then you would be spat out of the hole at the end. And then you've got all this air around you and you're back on the ridge in the um, very airy setting. That's the only caving experience that I've had, but that was quite that was quite interesting. What about you? Have you been caving? Yeah, I went caving when I was a kid at school. We went to Wales and we went caving. And you talk about moments where you were like, I'm not doing this ever again. And that was one of those moments. I was like, we uh, we went we went into this cave and you kind of like you kind of rummage about and you know, you've got your helmet on, but you've got like your gear and you're wearing sort of like a suit and you kind of like going into these holes and you're going head first. And then sometimes you're kind of like dipping down with your legs first. And there was this one time where sort of, we were like, we were crawling, but I'm not saying there was like that much space. Like you've got, I don't know how many tons of rock above you and you know, you're kind of crawling, you can barely see it. And part of my clothing got stuck on something and I'm thinking I couldn't move. And I'm like, I'm stuck. And I've got all of them, obviously my class behind me and I then can't see the person in front of me. And I just have like panic attack, like, yeah. cause one, I don't really like, I wasn't you know, as a kid, I didn't really like the dark and I was quite, a, I was quite a big lad. So I was carrying quite a bit. And I, you know, when you're in those moments, you kind of, it's really difficult to think objectively and think, okay, how am I going to get out of this? Because your mind's going a thousand, you know, miles per hour about, you know, what's going to happen if I don't move, you know, like what happens if, you know, whatever, there's so many things go through your mind. And, you know, I eventually sort of like scratch my way out of it. And then, and then we have to kind of go head first, but we had to kind of go head first, but like, then I couldn't see anyone. So you had to trust that there was someone there to kind of catch you. And I'm like, this, this is, this is a no go. Like, and I think, I think after reading your book and kind of, I've been thinking about ways I can challenge myself. Maybe there's like a hole there um that i need to go back in order to do it sort of like seal it if that makes sense because yeah. i've got this feeling about it and i think the only way to get a get across it or, or get over that is to then go do it again because you know i've been reading books by like david goggins and people who have like done so much to challenge themselves and i think it's the difficult thing is those challenges that scare you the most it, almost you have to then go do them if they scare you because as much as you don't think about barriers that is a barrier to whatever you want to do it's not just that challenge it's everything else because that confidence that you would get from getting over that would you know enable you to do so much more across the, all of your life and 
it's not just that one challenge. That's what I've found. It's, it's like a breadth of experience across the board. Yeah, you're, you're so right. And I think it's those difficult things that we can uh, use to grow personally so much. And it's, uh, it's finding the things that will challenge all of us. And I love that. I think that the caving thing for you, that's perfect. That sounds like a brilliant way for you to go and, and really test out um, how, you, how you stay in control in a situation where you know you're going to feel uncomfortable. And yeah, the, the, you're right. The higher purpose of it is to, you know, if you can deal with that situation, then you're, you know what works in things, the curveballs in life that are going to happen and uh, you're more prepared and that's the theory anyway you prepare by you know you prepare for adversity by practicing adversity that's something that i just really i love mm -hmm. that concept um and I, i'm a big fan of the anti-bucket list which is something i talk about quite a bit everyone knows the bucket list which is you know i want to go to x y and z do this before i die and it's a very positive very interesting way of um you know setting goals but I think that we can also play around with the anti-bucket list, the opposite, mm -hmm. like your caving experience, things that you would hate to do. You really just don't want to do. And you probably, you might not have to do, you know, before you die. I don't want to go caving. I don't want to, you know, go up tall towers because I hate heights. I don't want to pick up a spider because I'm afraid of that. I don't want to go swimming in the deep sea because I hate yeah. it. And we can avoid it. As adults, it's very easy for us to avoid the things we don't want to do. Um, but I like the idea of creating this list, this anti-bucket list of things that really scare us and then deliberately seeking them out and yeah, just attacking them and trying to work with them and bringing all these ideas into that space when we, we fight against them. What's, so, and that's a lot of, sorry. sorry, yeah, I was going to say like a lot of my challenges in the book are based off that yeah. anti, the anti-bucket list concept. What's the what's number one on the anti bucket list? Because I have one apart, apart from caving. Because I think caving is like number three. I have number one on my anti bucket list. What's your number one? So, so that you kind of like right don't now do. or before? Right, like right now after doing all these. Okay, still it's uh, I, I haven't done it yet. It's going to be done. Um, giving blood. That's that right now. That is okay. And and for most people, they'll just be like, oh, what? That's nothing. Mm. Um, but for me, there's just yeah. It's, it's, it makes me feel, even thinking about it now. Um, I can tell. <laughs> so, but then I know that it's uh, it's going to be a great one. So I'm I'm actually looking forward to doing that because I it's uh, it's something a that I can write about and I can practice all of these things. Mm -hmm. So it might seem small and yeah, in the scheme of things, it is small and it's not very, you know. But actually, for me, I do feel that a, a disproportionate amount of resistance to it for how um straightforward it should be so that's something that i want to explore more but of course there are lots of other things on the list that you know what, what about you what's your number one mine's mine's holding a tarantula like anytime i watch david attenborough anytime i watch planet earth and i see a tarantula i just i leave the room like i can't do it like my body shivers I get like sweats and I'm like, it's not even in the room. It's like, it's just a digital, it's just a digital representation of a tarantula, but I don't know why I have an aversion like spiders. I'm fine with like domestic spiders. You know, if I come across a spider, I'm fine. It's just the tarantula. I don't know what it is. Um, I think Lord of the Rings put me off. Do you remember when, <laughs> <laughs> you know, when they come across that, that massive spider? Uh, I think I remember watching that when I was a kid and be like, nah, I can't do that. Uh, but for me, I think that is like just envisioning holding it. And I think the only way I'm going to get across it, if I actually do it, because I don't know why it just, there's an aversion in my mind to it. I don't know why. It's normal though. Like that's a perfectly rational thing to be afraid of. It's, it's something that, you know, could have killed us. Okay. Maybe trances aren't poisonous, right? They can't kill us, but our brains, our primitive minds will think, you know, every insect is potentially life-threatening so that's why we have this inbuilt fear of it i guess it's why a lot of people have a problem with blood as well because when you see blood you shouldn't be seeing blood there's that yeah. fear thing um which is very primal with heights as well and loud noises and being trapped and all of these things these kind of phobias that people have they're rooted in um a survival mechanism that we all have so it's not it, yeah it's not unusual to to have that it's perfectly rational but i think it's it's how we play with it and uh, yeah, what can be done? So that's a good one. Okay, yeah, that, that one's my one. And you know, I'm I'm 
I feel like I'm maybe a bit too domesticated. I feel like I need to like reading your book and reading your story. And like my, my brother and I, like my brother's kind of done a bit of mountaineering, but we both of us have talked about, you know, doing a bit more like walking and mountaineering in particular. And I think for, for me in particular, it's spending time doing things that are challenging yourself, but also doing things that are like unusual. Like I'm quite a sporty person. Like, and you know, like give me something with a ball and a bat. Like I'm, I can do it for, for days. Like you can just lead me and I'll be fine. But there's something different about, you know, like mountaineering or climbing. Like I've done some climbing before, but like, what would you say to someone who's just completely new to like mountaineering? Cause I'm sure you know, you've had so much experience. Like, what would you say to someone like me? who's just kind of wanting to get into it, but doesn't really know how to. Okay, so I think you've got a couple of things you can do. Firstly, you want to look at quite an easy peak, something that you, you're confident you can do yourself that has no technical difficulty. So something like Snowdon has a, there's lots of routes up Mount Snowdon in North Wales. Um, and I think you can just choose the easiest one, which is, it's essentially just hiking up a mountain. And you'll get a sense of that and you can just go and have a little adventure. It doesn't have to be anything crazy, but it's just getting a sense of what it's like to be in the mountains. And you can do a little bit of research. The British Mountaineering Council have an amazing website and they're, um, they're this group and essentially they do like insurance and other stuff, but they're all about supporting mountaineers and climbers and hill walkers. And there's so much stuff there. And that's just a good place to begin. Uh, and they can highlight all the different peaks and mountains that might be a good option. So that's the first thing you can do. But if you want to get, you know, if you want a slightly spicier experience, mm. I, I would always recommend hiring a guide or going with a, um, a group. And there's loads of people all over the UK, all over the planet that do that guiding, um, like guided experiences in the mountains. And that is fantastic because you're not worried about the, oh, is this stupid for me to be doing you know it's extremely safe so that means you can push yourself and it's a very like it's a very controlled environment you don't have to consider all the variables like the weather and the route and what happens if something goes wrong you you actually you've got someone else that knows what to do and you're delegating all of your worry to them and mm. actually that means you can go and have an amazing experience and they can take you to you know some incredible places and instantly you'll be thrown into uh, something very unfamiliar or of course if you know someone that climbs that's another way to get someone who's got experience to take you along yeah. so those are the three things I think you can yeah I remember doing it a bit when I was at school like we did some sort of extended walking or, or mountaineering I loved um I loved kayaking in particular like I wish we had like more stuff here like I see other countries and they have like kayaking like ev like everywhere I just love to do that, like extended, extended pieces of kayaking or something. I don't know. Have you done that? Yeah, I've done some kayaking. Um, I recently tried stand up paddleboarding, which was really fun. Have you okay. done that? No, I've never done that before. Where'd you do that? Uh, so I did that in Thailand, um, which was really fun. Really, um, actually, it was quite a, an interesting experience being out on the sea with it because it's quite choppy and it's yeah. keeping your balance on the board. Um, but it's really fast, actually. You can cover distance quite quickly, and uh, when you get into a rhythm with it, it's it's really nice. So I'd like to I'd like to get into a bit more of that. Uh, there's lo there's quite a bit in the UK, I think, but it's uh, it's a fun way of moving around on the water. Okay, there's another aversion I have to the sea. I think this, I just find the sea really scary. <laughs> I don't know what it is. I think for me, like. I, it's once again i maybe need to stop watching nature documentaries <laughs> yeah. when they start like showing like the sea and you know you have those like boats and the shipping containers and like the waves are like i don't know how many feet up in the air and they're crashing and stuff yeah. um, i just i don't know it's just in in your mind and then you know you don't know what's below you i think that's what it is for me like you don't know what's below you yeah and you just got that in your back of your mind you're like i have no idea and you're in their territory like you're not going to outswim anything. You're not going to outmaneuver anything. You're just sort of like, you're just waiting. They're just waiting for you. It's the unknown, isn't it? It's that, yeah, the darkness of it. I'll tell you what, there's an amazing book that I highly recommend. It's called The Art of Resilience by Ross Edgley. And okay. he has swam, he, he recently, it was a couple of years ago, he swam around the whole of Great Britain. And uh, the book is about his experience doing that. 
and yeah, there's times where he has to swim through all of these jellyfish oh actually constantly so he grows a massive beard so that he can uh, protect his face from all of the jellyfish things and then at one point this whale like accompanies him for ages and um, it is amazing all of the wildlife that he encounters going literally swimming all the way from Margate all the way around and then it's back crazy how long does that person, take him um I think half a year but he was the, they had a boat a support boat and he would sleep on the support boat each night and then they would use GPS to find exactly where he'd stopped the previous day but there were all these amazing obstacles that he had to overcome and that's, uh, that's crazy such a, an adventurous book and just the fact that he's out there doing all of these uh yeah crazy is he, things is he the guy who swim who like swam with a log is that the same guy same guy that's it the try ah, okay the i thought i recognized him yeah um he's brilliant he talks a little bit about stoicism in his book as well actually so okay. it's great to see people applying philosophy and that's that's what's great about his his journey because so many people said that you couldn't do that uh, this isn't possible to swim around great britain and, and especially with his build if you look at him on instagram he's uh, he's unbelievably built uh he's massive and um he hasn't got a swimmer's body apparently um and uh, yeah there was loads of people saying he couldn't do it mm. and it's just how he dealt with that how he pushed back and and it was more of a mental thing than physical for him actually and it's yeah interesting to explore that well it's interesting it, it i think it most things are aren't they they're mostly mental like the things we've been talking about most of the things are kind of just mental rather than like a physical challenge like some some things are physical obviously but it's more how is your mind dealing with it when you're when you're doing it in in the moment uh, and in anticipatory because it's always the anticipation that gets you at the end of the day isn't it absolutely yeah it's always those those feelings yeah. those feelings and have you found a way i know there's probably not because there's always going to be ways that you're going to feel that feeling before doing something that's challenging but how have you found perhaps through affirmations or whatever it might be to to come across some of those anticipatory feelings of not wanting to do it well how to deal with it when you feel yeah it. well i think the first thing is to acknowledge that that is going to happen and it should happen and it's natural. That's massive because when you resist it and you're like, oh, why do I feel so nervous about this? And well, you know, I don't want to do it, I don't want to do it. When you lean into that, you feed quite a negative part of you and it becomes something that you're trying to stop that from happening and you can't control that. It's just, it's gonna happen and you just accept it. And I think um, knowing that that is just a normal part of preparation for whatever it is that you're doing and just settling with those sensations and you can bring a bit of mindfulness to it. I find that that's quite helpful. Just focusing on my breathing. Mm -hmm. I got into meditating and I think becoming conscious of yeah, how, how all of these sensations are sitting in your body can be really powerful actually, because it's, it's just the temporary sensation as long as you remember that. And it's always, as soon as you start doing it, whatever it is, whether it's, you know, public speaking or whether it's, doing like a scary climb or whether it's, you know, going and asking someone out on a date or something. I think you have all those, that kind of fear before you do it. But then when you actually are doing it, that all goes away most of the time. Um, unless oh, you not if they say no. Then suddenly... <laughs> <laughs> but then it's kind of you care, exactly. Yeah. You've got this, uh, I think when you're in the, the process of doing it and the flow of doing it, mm. that fear can often melt away and you're just in that you're doing it mm. um so i think it's just accepting it and like breathing through it not trying to deny it and then the more you do it the less um i guess the less you, you become desensitized to it in a way mm. less power it has over you uh, but that's all very well saying that but as soon as you do something scary and you've got way more adrenaline than you're used to yeah what about like how do you yeah how do you manage it breathe or try and do something physical um, to try and burn up some of that adrenaline. Like, if you're going to tell me like, oh yeah, you know, before oh, I had to like hold a tarantula, you know, just breathe and focus on breathing. I'd be like, just shut up. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> <Like, laughs> it's like, it's just a lot more difficult to, to think about that in the moment. I feel that's why I feel like some people have an aversion to like philosophy or, or, or that kind of stuff is they're like, yeah, it's great, but it's, it's that practicality in the moment. And that's why you have to put yourself in those positions regularly because the yeah. more you overcome it, the more, you, the more you get through it. 
I've been reading quite recently, actually, as well as about breathing techniques. Who I know you you mentioned uh, Wim Hof in in the book. Yeah. How effective have you found breathing techniques? Because it's something that I actually want to get into. I just haven't read that widely about it. Yeah, the Wim Hof technique is really interesting. That's really cool. He's this amazing. For those uh, for those people who don't know about him, he's the Ice Man, and he has all of these world records for. Um, dealing with the cold he's climbed Kilimanjaro in his pants and he's got like the longest time in an ice bath and he's got incredible control over his mind and body you'll see if you go on his Instagram you'll see him just in frozen lakes all the time and uh, he's come up with this method where you um, it's worth it's worth actually checking him out but it's breathing uh, there's like a little method where you breathe quite quickly and deeply and then you hold your breath and it's very similar to what free divers do to increase their lung capacity so that they can uh, basically be underwater for five minutes plus Mm. which is crazy but when you're doing the exercise what's interesting is you can see when you first start doing it that actually your breath you can hold your breath for longer than you think and when the more you do it you oxygenate your lungs so you can hold your breath for longer Um, and there's no denying you feel pretty good afterwards Uh, And he he uses this to deal with extreme cold. So he does this method of breathing and then will expose himself to the cold and his body is better at dealing with it. Mm. But that's one, yeah, that's one type of breathing exercise that is, uh, I think a lot of people can have fun with that and explore it. But he's a great character anyway, even if you don't get into it, just checking out some of the stuff he's done. Yeah, I I have. I remember, I remember I used to, I used to collect Guinness World Records as a kid. And I always used to, I always used to see him kind of as a kid, and I kind of thought, oh, that guy looks crazy, kind of like sitting on an iceberg in the middle of the Arctic, just yeah. like cross-legged. <laughs> that dude's figured something out. But yeah, to be able to do that, you know, there's no denying it. The science behind it. If he if he can do this extreme feat, um, which the human body is amazing, uh, it shows that he's got control over his uh, his mind and his body. And so there's, I think there's a lot of uh, value there that are very practical you know you can see it Mm. just he's not saying he can do this he's actually going out and doing it that that to me is a really important thing is practitioners i think this is where i feel like philosophy is that if we're going to go back to it it's like i always resonate with people who have done it before i don't have you read david goggins book oh yeah he's amazing yeah like that guy is just i think for me the thing that resonated with me the most from him was the relentless pursuit to to the like of the 40 percent rule is the idea of everything you're doing you're only ever at 40 percent and that consistent growth mindset is so important and i think any challenge that you want to kind of come across i think that's really important what resonated with you with that book um i so i came across goggins through um, the book Living with Seal, Living with a Seal. Oh, uh, by Jesse Eisner. Yeah, that's it. And I love yeah. that because he, um, David Goggins goes and lives with him and pushes him to do all of these things and um, for, for a month, I think it is. Yeah. And I just thought it was brilliant how he was just so, uh, his mind was incredible. And then, yeah, when that book came out, I, uh, I saw human being i think i think when i when i when i heard his story especially the him staying with jesse eisner was i i hadn't read the book but i'd heard an interview he did and the, he did something like running four miles uh, every four hours for 48 hours. Something ridiculous like that. And I was just like, how crazy would that be? I, I kind of want to try it. And I think that's probably going to be on my negative bucket list. Yeah. But <laughs> it's one of those things where I'm like, that is crazy. And in the, in the book, he talks about bad water or, you know, running, you know, hundred miles or whatever it is and in, in through death valley or whatever it is and it's just pushing yourself to that limit it, it inspires you as a person to really question like what am i not doing like and this is this is 
how do you value the importance of thinking about yourself negatively? Like not in the, the sense of, you know, putting yourself down, but there is, do you believe there is some value in that? Cause I personally believe there is some value in saying to yourself, like you are flawed in some way, but then using that as positively to improve yourself. Because I feel like at the moment we're too much in the mindset of think of ourselves as being enough or thinking of ourselves as being sort of, we're okay the way we are, but I feel like that's dangerous at the same time because you always need to constantly be challenging yourself and saying to yourself that you can get better. Yeah. I think, I think both is important because I think it is important. I think it's uh, yeah, it's vital to be happy with where you are. Yeah. Um, but also have that other side where you, you want to improve and you, you want to be better. And I think it, they almost, they're, contradictory mm. and i think it's it's finding that balance with it so that you are accepting with where you are right now but you know you want to improve and you want to get better so that's where process over results is is huge mm. because i think focusing on actually every day just trying to slowly push yourself a little bit but also being accepting of you know where you are and self-awareness that you know we've all got limitations and exploring that and playing and around with that is uh, it can be very beneficial i think but do you that, journal uh, i do yeah do you, do, what's your what's your process for journaling are you more sort of just sort of brain dumping or do you have like a, stru a set structure of you know affirmations and and a, a structure to it so normally it's um there's two types of things i've got i've got like I guess you could say sort of journaling where it's a list where everything that's in my mind, I'll just throw it down onto a piece of paper. So I've got so many notebooks of things, whether it's an idea, whether it's something I'm worried about, whatever, it's just getting it onto the page. And actually when you've got so many things in your mind, just putting them onto the page just helps you to have a bit of space from them. And you, it just stops you from being so clogged. Mm. I found that's very helpful. And then I have a bit more of a systematic thing in the evening where I will write down how long I meditated for. Um, I've got a few things like daily goals. Like I, I always make sure that well, I aim to exercise, meditate. Um, and then there's a few other things on there that I try and monitor diet and all these other things. Uh, and that's just monitoring it and just checking in. I find that's, that's very helpful. Like the Japanese knowing how much I've studied each day. Mm. So I can total it up over time. And then maybe it's just the other thing is just like writing a couple of things, nice things that have happened in the day, focusing on positivity and every day something great will happen. It's just choosing to look at it like that. It doesn't have to be massive. It can be just like going for an ice cream, you know, I mean, my girlfriend went for an ice cream the other day and that yeah. went on the list because it was just a lovely thing to do. It yeah. doesn't have to be like, Oh, you know, I don't know, insert some crazy, exciting, mad thing mm. it, it can be the smallest thing and i think it's just looking for nice positive things and cultivating that um a more of a positive approach to life and yeah. being grateful for what you've got as well i think that's really important like um i i don't meditate because um i'm religious so it's more like through actual you know physical prayer and and, and that um but for me, I think that gratitude is really important because I think that centers you to then give perspective for, cause everything's a perspective game. It's like you said, it's just the way in which you see it. If you're, if you're, I don't particularly, the law of interaction for me is very, an interesting one to me because I feel like it's, it's important to have that level of gratitude and faith, um, which is central, you know, regardless of who you are as a human being, I think faith is what keeps us, faith and hope is what keeps us going forward. But at the same time, you know, it's that action thing. It's like you can't just sit back and wait for it to, to happen to you. And, and that's really important. And that's really important. For me, I think I don't have a strict routine when it comes to like in the evening, but I think for the morning, I think for me, it's, it's really important is like get up, pray and kind of go do something like straight away like i'm i'm a big person in doing something before like working because i I, f I don't know why i just feel like it gets you in the right mindset i think doing something early in the morning to challenge yourself is a great way to start the day you know and because you you almost feel like you have a running head start across 
uh, uh, you know, for, um, compared to other people. Like I remember um, even now, you know, with colleagues, you're like, I can just say to them, like, I've got up at like 4.30, you've gone for a run, done all these kind of things. And they're like, oh, I only got up an hour ago. Mm. So you, you almost feel like you're, you're ahead of the game, which I think is, I think is really important for confidence. Because I think it's a confidence game, especially if you're building on things and, and you're really ambitious. I think that's really important. Really important. What, what challenges have you got in your, in, your, uh, in your diary? I know it's a bit difficult now with, with lockdown and everything, but what is, uh, what's, what's, on the, uh, what's on the cards at the moment? So it's tough, isn't it? Because yeah. it's, uh, it's looking forward and trying to project um, what, what can happen, but also um, not getting carried away because I think it's been responsive to the current environment. But yeah, at the moment, everything's all to do with the book. So getting out and talking and, I've got some workshops that I'm going to be doing in the future. So I did one uh, a month ago. So that was really nice to get into that space and taking an idea from a book and turning it into a talk and getting out and doing that. Um, so that in itself, all of this has been not a challenge. I guess you could call it a challenge, but it's, 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 uh, it's been an interesting new adventure. Mm. Um, challenge wise, I've got a few things just, kind of endurance events, um, some things that I'm probably going to sort of save announcing. Um, and then, yeah, I'm desperate to do a fire walk. I had what I had okay. it booked and it got canceled twice. So that's something that is definitely going to happen as soon as it's, uh, it's allowed to take place. Um, I'm really keen to give that a go. It looks really interesting. It looks really fun. And it's basically, you... sorry, what were you saying? Have you ever done an Ironman? No, I haven't. That's that's uh, that's that's something. That's something that I've got. I've, I I really want to sort of commit time and effort to. For me, I feel like that's like the pinnacle of like endurance for me. I don't know. It just seems like it just seems so challenging and and so like amazing. So brutal. I think the commitment level as well. That's it. It's the training. Um, you need to want that so bad because it's uh, it's going to take up a lot of time training training for something that epic uh, but that in itself has got a lot of value because you're going to learn so much about discipline um so i think it's yeah it's uh, it's that's a really cool challenge have you done are you planning on doing like a half iron man to work up to yeah it? i'm just going to work up to it yeah so you know it's it's a bit disappointing because i was like in a really good routine pre like corona and um, pre-lockdown i think and this is what this kind of couple of months has taught me is like how do you deal with things that are not in your control i think that's really important and what it's shown you is how can you continue to challenge yourself even if the things that you usually were available was not available to you and it's been a great opportunity for me to kind of think out the box and 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 challenge myself in different ways but yeah i'll just work up to it you know once swimming pools back open up i'll just go back and do all that kind of stuff you know i've been starting getting cycling again and, and running and it's just exciting for me the thing that i've been learning about is heart rate training see i never i never thought about heart training before i thought you know just go out for a run but then i realized that if you're going to do an endurance event you have to be in a certain heart rate zone in order to get the the best you know time because you don't want to wear yourself out so you know i've got heart rate monitor now and you know it's it's all it's all scientific i feel very excited about it it's just uh it's great no that's awesome that's such an amazing goal to work towards as well I think yeah that's, uh, that's really exciting fire walking though is that like is that i'm, I'm this is gonna sound really stupid but is it is it on coals yeah so it's uh this is this isn't quite as, <laughs> as big as an Iron Man, but it's it's just I kind of like the idea of it. Um, they they uh, put a load of coals out, maybe ten meters of coals, and you walk across it. I think it's more of a mental thing than anything. Um, you don't have to train for it. They give you a little training thing before, maybe like thirty minutes in the car park. They'll tell you what: <laughs> don't stop when you're halfway through. <laughs> um, but I, I imagine that's it. I don't, I don't really know. I think it's, it's just more of that, put your mind in, in one place and just, just go, just walk and trust. Um, so there's a lot of, I think it's just quite a fun thing to do. Uh, you, yeah. can do Lego, you can do a Lego walk and a glass walk as well. So I, I'd like to... Glass? Yeah, yeah apparently. That seems a bit, seems a bit dangerous. I think it's, if there's enough of it, it's like, it's like the principle of the, um, the bed of nails. Oh, I see what you, you mean. Line, okay. You line a bed of nails 
um, that because there's so many tiny points of um, contact, yeah. it distributes the pressure. I mean, I would not recommend that anyone smashes a glass and tries to walk over it. <laughs> I think this is like a controlled environment, you yeah. know. Um, but yeah, I want to explore all of those things. And, and I like the quirky challenges. I've got one which I think is, is quite stupid. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to be allowed to do it, but um, which I won't, I won't say, actually, because okay. if, I, if I can do it, it would be quite funny. Uh, so there's lots of things that I just try and look outside the box as well. I like yeah. exploring the weird and wonderful ones. Um, that's that's what always uh, inspires me as well. Just mm. thinking, this, where where can we find challenge? In where can you ways? find the quirky ones? Is that you researching, or is that you literally coming up with the ideas? It's a mix because I'll take inspiration from different places. Like some of the challenges in my book are a bit weird, um, and people say that, but that's that's the point, and it's it's looking to. Some of them are conventional, of course. So you're yeah. running marathons, climbing mountains, it's not that weird. But, you know, maybe some of the other ones, picking locks and deliberately queuing um, just to work on your mindset. Those, those are slightly obscure. So I think it's, yeah, it's a mix. Things that I come up with myself based on maybe the anti-bucket list and, mm. and just playing around with ideas, what would be interesting. Mm. And then, of course, like other people doing things as well. I always feed, feed off that. One, one. I remember reading a, an article. I think it's an article. It might be in a podcast with Tim Ferriss, the author. And one of the things he said to challenge yourself was go to a coffee shop and ask for a discount. And I remember doing that. And it's amazing the the look that the that the uh, <laughs> that the staff give you because you're asking for a ten percent discount is amazing. So you just go up to them and you're like. They're like, oh, that's like three pounds fifty. You're like, oh, can I have a ten percent discount? They're like, oh, do you have a discount card? I'm like, no. And you just look at them, and they're like, uh, and I'm like, can I have a discount? And they look at you. They're like, um, okay. And you just don't leave yeah. until you get your discount. Yeah. And for me, I think that is really important because it's like, it's kind of challenging them, but it's challenging you. It's like, what are you willing to do? to to get that discount and it's not about the discount itself it's about that uncomfortable pause i think that pause is really important where you're kind of just staring at each other and like what are we doing here <laughs> what are we doing here and I, I i think you're right i think there's there's weird and wonderful ways to challenge yourself and it doesn't have to be as epic as doing an, an iron man or you know swimming around great britain or something crazy as that i mean it's almost sometimes it's the awkward ones like queuing or i don't know nothing really really awkward comes to my mind but like the ones that are just when you tell someone they kind of go oh like they cringe kind of thing like yeah. it's just an awkward thing to do i think those ones are sometimes i think the most fun yeah absolutely and i think as long as you're holding on to that there is a higher purpose to this it's not just being an idiot for being an idiot's sake there's you know there is a reason for you to you know maybe dress in an embarrassing way it's not just it's not to seek attention from other people it's to work with feeling like an idiot or feeling uncomfortable. It's to play around with that. And we can, yeah, there's, there's so many different things. And of course, everyone will be triggered by different things. So I guess it's, uh, it's so individual. And that's what has been so nice about having this project and book out is hearing how different people are connecting with different challenges and, and you know, getting pictures from people doing things. And I just, I just love that. And yeah. coming up with things that I haven't thought of and, it's really cool. It's, so I think there's a, a lot of fun that we can all have with this. What's the craziest thing someone sent you that they've done? Uh, so, well, someone sent me the craziest thing someone sent me, not that they've done, was like, I want to do this. And it's a picture of someone skydiving and sol solving a Rubik's Cube at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> that's brilliant. I was like, okay, that's really cool. Yeah. Um, I get a lot of people, like, lots of Rubik's Cube pictures, lots of cold shower pictures, lots of, like, uh, no nudity. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> just like oh look i just had my first cold shower and uh, and then like a lot of people swimming in the sea and like yeah. doing all of those kind of things and um telling me their their goals and their challenges so mm. it's that was really, really cool for you it's awesome it's so nice to um to hear what people are up to and i can take inspiration from that and um i'm sure there'll be some ideas that come to me that i will filter into some future projects as well so mm. it's just really uh it's been really fun. It's, it's something that I never thought of when I was creating this project. Um, but actually, there is a real 
um, there's like a nice community feel with it and especially with friends as well that's been uh, with some of my friends some of the things that they've been up to off the back of the book reading the book and stuff so that's mm. that's been particularly nice you know when someone's actually said oh uh, I'm going to do this because I read your book and actually I feel like I want to try that so that that's very uh, rewarding and really nice I almost think when it impacts the people somewhat closest to you, I feel like that's probably the most impactful thing about it. Like what's happened with me, especially with my pages, like the more I've read, the more I've found that actually the people around me see what it's done for me and actually have started to take all my books on my bookshelf. And I think for, for me, that's, you know, it's great, obviously people out, you know, just outside your immediate family and, and them resonating with the message that you're giving. But I almost think when it, impacts the people that are closest to you and know you the best that's almost when it takes on a different level yeah yeah that's it that's it i think it's so lovely when people in your life um do little things and you can feel like oh that's that's really cool that you're doing that um i still haven't convinced my mum to have a cold shower though that's oh, really my number one goal just to try and get, <laughs> like she's she's really she's very alternative she's into uh, loads of different concepts and things but uh, and she loves the Wim Hof concept, but she's yet to get in the cold shower. So I am determined. Okay. No, that's, that's... <laughs> How's, what's, what's, your, what's your strategy? Uh, I'm just, I, I don't know. Maybe I just start talking about her on podcasts and things enough. <laughs> and I hope that she will um, give it a go. So, yeah, we'll see. We'll see, uh, how, we'll see how that one goes. My mum, my mum's, in fact, actually, when I think about it, my mum has done a fire walk. I remember she telling me back in the day that she used, she's done, my mum's quite adventurous. Okay. So she's like, she's done, you know, marathons. She's done, you know, triathlons in, in the sea and stuff. She's just like full on challenge herself, especially in her younger years. You know, now it's, it's not as much, but I think that's for perhaps, you know, where some, sometimes where that seed is, is sown. I think it was that the case with yours as well. Was, were there people around you that kind of inspired you to, to, to have those challenges and seek those adventures? Um, I think that was just a, a response. I, I guess the kind of stoic, the Stoics were really inspirational because they used to push themselves and challenge themselves. And I love that idea because of the pragma, like the pragmatic side of Stoicism. That's why I really resonated with that because it's yeah. so practical and all those things that they used to do. Um, that really was one of the, the key influences to this this whole project and everything just i have this image there's a cato not so famous stoic he used to deliberately wear something embarrassing so that his peers would laugh at him and he could practice feeling shame and, and just not letting it be an issue and i just love that i just thought that was so brilliant you know thousands of years ago someone dressing up like an idiot just so that they can practice that so yeah they were really inspiring um for me to uh, to get out and explore it what's the craziest thing you've worn in public then um a crazy there's this ah oh, it's a horrible it's probably doesn't even sound that crazy it's this um vest i bought in america and it's uh it's like a really no sleeves like really low and it's got like palm trees and this american flag on it it's it's in it's so intense like it's just so that sounds that sounds cool. horrendous i've got some hats as well that i got <laughs> bought in japan which are ridiculous so um yeah it's just uh yeah okay I, I wore i wore chicken chicken suit once that was interesting yeah. do you know when you go to like the cricket and you wear like a chicken suit okay right it was like one of those that was pretty fun that was pretty that was a pretty fun thing to do i think it's important to do things that are just a bit challenging and a bit silly i think that 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 keeps it keeps it fun and interesting doesn't it so um Great. I mean, thanks so much for coming on. And I, I think we've had a, we've had a great conversation. It was great speaking to you about the book. What have you, uh, have you got anything planned? I know you're talking about like workshops, but you know, is there any, something else in, in the works? What, like another book? Or? Yeah. I've got so many books in my head. Um, it's just a matter of time before they get on the page. So okay. it, yeah, that's uh, something that I'm working on at the moment. It's just all about focusing on this project and, um, but yeah, there's there's some things that I've got lined up in future that I'm very excited about. So we'll uh, watch this space. <laughs> yeah, watch this space. Yeah. Um, firstly, I, actually, I forgot to mention your book came in the best package 
I think I've ever received with a book. I get sent a lot of books. Yeah. I remember I got it and, you know, I opened it slightly and then I was like, I've got to do like a whole unboxing of this. This is great. And, uh, you know, it came with like origami. It came with like, I've never actually tried those. Um, what are they called? The cranes. Sorry? The crane. The origami. No, no, the sweets. Oh, the toxic waste. Yeah. I've never tried those before. It's weird. I, it was horrendous. Like I've I've tried some some weird things in in the past. I couldn't I couldn't finish it. I was like I put it in my mouth for like ten seconds, and I'm like I've got to I've got this for this one so <laughs> again. But that was really cool. And then yeah, it came with um you know like mini Rubik's cube, and yeah, that was like the best package like I've ever received. Oh, so thanks, thanks, oh, thank thanks so you. much for that. No, it's it's nice because I think it's such a visual. Um, aspect, a practical aspect to this whole thing. So it's nice to have some challenges that you can hold and you can actually see, okay, this is, you know, these are some little things that you can try yeah. and to get behind it. Cause yeah, it's just all about the practicality. Yeah. That's the really important bit. Anyway, thanks so much. Um, I know we're going to have you featured in, in the magazine as well, the, the coming out in, in August. So I'm looking forward to that, obviously working with you to, to get that done as well. So uh, thanks so much for taking the time. And it was, it was great to speak to you um, about the book. The book's here. If you haven't read it already, definitely recommend it. Um, ben, it's been a pleasure. Well, and uh, I look forward to speaking to you again soon. Yeah, thank you so much, Sean. It's been lovely chatting to you. And I'm really grateful for you uh, asking me on. So thank you so much. You're welcome.